it, you spick and span slouch. Don't be long. The more I rub this, the dustier it gets. It just seems to attract the dust. Here we go again. How can I help? Stella, look at this. Look at her hair. Now that is wicked. Look, get off you two. I want to show her this. When I rub this strip, it picks up pieces of paper. See? I know what that is. Static electricity. Like the balloons. I know that, but look. If there is a strip which hasn't been rubbed, it doesn't work. See? Why does rubbing it make static electricity? Can you investigate? I'm on to it. How can an old yellow duster produce such a strange effect? What's going on? You can't see them with the naked eye, but this polythene strip contains many tiny electrically charged particles. Some of these are positive charges, and some are negative charges. The cloth contains charged particles too. There are exactly the same number of positive and negative charges. They cancel each other out. So the whole object has no total charge. We say it's neutral. As I rub the strip with the cloth, Negative charges transferred from the cloth to the strip. As there are more negative than positive charges on the strip now, it has a negative charge. The opposite happens when I rub the acetate strip. This time, the negative charges move the other way, from the strip onto the duster. So this time, there are more positive than negative charges left on the acetate strip. It now has a positive charge. The positive and negative charges on these strips appear to stay put. And that's why the effect is called a static charge. And charged objects attract neutral objects like the paper. But it's the rubbing that makes the strips charged in the first place. The effects of static charge aren't always as harmless as this, as Femi's about to find out. No-one said science and action would be glamorous. But while I get to clean the carpet, it looks like the action's elsewhere. These guys work for the Air Sea Rescue. If I give them a hand cleaning their celebrity red carpet, they're going to help me out with an investigation. Cleaning. I keep getting these shots. Ouch! The soles of my shoes are on the carpet. There are millions of tiny positive and negative charges on my shoe and the carpet. You can't see them because they're invisible. But when I rub my shoe on the carpet, some of the negative charges are transferred from the carpet to my shoe. The negative charges appear to stay put on my shoe because my shoes are made out of plastic. Materials that behave like this are called insulators. My body also contains a mixture of positive and negative charges. The distribution of these charges changes as the positive charge on my body is attracted to the negative charge on my shoes. This leaves a negative charge on my body which suddenly flows when I touch the carpet sweeper. Ouch! That's because it's made out of metal, a conductor. A conductor allows the electrical charge to flow. Let's take a look at that again. As I touch the sweeper, 
the negative charges flow through my arm and down the metal handle, so I get a tiny shock. Ouch. This helicopter might look very different to my shoes, but a very similar thing happens here. We are going to investigate it. When a helicopter flies through the air, dust particles in the air bounce off the blades and the body of the aircraft. This causes a buildup of negative charge on the helicopter. The charge can't escape because the helicopter is surrounded by air, an insulator. This buildup of charge could be a problem for Terry here, the winchman. His job is to come down a lifeline to rescue people stranded in places the helicopter can't land. But imagine what would happen if he touched the ground. The charge on the helicopter could escape through his body to the ground, and he'd get a nasty shock. Is there an alternative? Hello there. Yes, there is an alternative. We um, attach a static line, which is about nine feet of wire, sheathed in the plastic coating for about three quarters of the length. It's attached to the winch hook, and the winchman comes down on the winch hook, holding onto the static line. When he gets close to the vessel, or onto the deck, he just touches the deck or the side of the vessel with the static line, the metal bit of the static line, and that discharges all the static electricity from the aircraft. Time to see it in action. Terry dangles the static line as he approaches the ground. It touches first, and instantly the charge escapes, so it's safe for him to land and rescue me. Meanwhile, I've got my own problem with static electricity. My wardrobe. Nylon and polyester and other artificial fibers are very good insulators. And when they're rubbed together, the charge that builds up is static and produces this annoying effect. But charged particles can manage to flow through materials like cotton and silk so the charge usually escapes and doesn't build up. And in this gear, there's no problem at all, because metals like brass and lead are conductors, and the charge flows through them easily. In insulators, the charges stay put. Static charge. But in conductors, the charges can flow freely. If they have a complete circuit, they can keep on flowing. It's called an electric current. But to get the charges moving, they need a push. This is called potential difference. The bigger the push, the bigger the current. Electric current, that's what your problem is. Your torch hasn't got enough current. Or enough potential difference. Not enough amps. Or volts. Or electric charge. Look, stop trying to be clever. It's just my battery running out. Yeah, but what exactly is it running out of? A battery is a store of energy which can provide the push, the potential difference, to get the current flowing. The current flows through the wires of a complete circuit and lights up the bulb. The bulb uses electrical energy, but not current. Look, the current is exactly the same before and after the bulb. We might think of bulbs as using current, but they don't. Sometimes models can help explain certain aspects. Here, the flow of negative charges in the water represent the current. The water wheel, like the bulb, uses energy as it turns. But the current before and after the water wheel 
is always the same. Eventually, the wheel uses all the electrical energy and the current stops flowing, but none of the charges are used up by the wheel. In the same way, in the electrical circuit, the current after the bulb is always the same as the current before, but eventually, the store of energy in the batteries runs out. I've come to the home of electricity in Britain, Blackpool. This was the first town in the country to have electric arc lighting. It's also home to the world famous Blackpool Illuminations. of electrical energy. The more light bulbs there are, the more energy you need. To provide this energy, you need an enormous push or potential difference. This potential difference is measured in volts. And that's what I'm going to investigate. This torch needs just three volts from its small batteries. And all the lights in here need a potential difference of 240 volts to give a decent light. These lights, we need a lot more power than that, won't we? Mike, this equipment looks very complicated. What's that big dial there? That indicates the voltage. Uh, the voltage or potential difference gives a big push in the conductor, and this gets the negatively charged particles or the electrons moving. And the rate of the flow of the electrons is the current? Yes, and for a given number of lamps, the higher the voltage we supply, the greater the current we use. And the bigger the current, the brighter the lights. Exactly. So, what would happen, Mike, if I use this torch's small batteries to light up the whole of Blackpool illuminations? Not much. Now, Mike isn't going to let me loose on the whole of the display, but he has given me a bank of lights for my experiment. Here goes with my three volt torch battery. These two connections join up to the bulbs. The current and the voltage at the moment are too small to light the lights. But I have come armed with a very large battery. 12 volts in the illuminations van. This time the bulbs do light up, but rather dimly. My next switch is wired up to the mains, 240 volts. Not bad, now that's more like it. But this is just for one bank of bulbs and for the whole of the illuminations we need. We need more than 6,500 volts. That provides us with the current to give enough power to light the illuminations. Are you ready for our dry run? Absolutely, here you go. electricity bill. Oh no, the primary jet gauge has failed again. There must be a break in the circuit. It needs fixing fast. Yes, it's a very low voltage circuit, so I can mend it safely. I need something that conducts electricity really well. What can I use to mend the circuit? How well something conducts electricity is determined by its resistance. The resistance of plastic, an insulator, is extremely high. So no current flows at all. Maybe the donut has a lower resistance. Yes, a small current flows. Good job this circuit has extremely low voltage and current, or all this would be very dangerous indeed. Bigger current, lower resistance. Bit messy, though. I know, something metal. Metals have a very low resistance. That's why they're used for wires. Great. That's my depth gauge fixed. 
but the next job's for Femi. Concrete blocks, metal drums, plastic pipes, all buried underground, and I've got to find them. Well, before I start digging, I'd like to know more. Maybe this guy can help. Hello, Chris. Hi, Femi. Now, you are an archaeologist, and you found loads of things. But how do you know where to dig? Well, I like to say it's intuition, but really it's the use of special instruments, like this one here. This is a resistivity meter, and it measures electrical resistance. Different materials have different electrical resistances, don't they? Yeah. Well, we use that to identify what's buried beneath the ground. By passing a current between a pair of electrodes stuck in the ground, we can measure the resistance between them. This resistance gives us a clue as to whether it's just Earth or maybe one of our buried objects below. Right, I'm putting the electrodes into the ground, running a current through them, 18 ohms. Now, is that reading of the resistance quite low? Well, it is for here. What do you think it's likely to be? Is it going to be the plastic, the metal or the concrete? I reckon it's the metal, because metal has to have a low resistance to conduct electricity. Yeah. Well, it's um, a high resistance, yeah. so maybe it's the plastic pipes or concrete blocks. Possibly. Should we try somewhere else? Mm. Come on. Hmm, I'm not falling for this one. I suspect that with this reading, it's um, about the reading of the ground. So, I don't think there's anything down there. So, then, Femi, when we put your results into the computer... What do the printout say? Yeah, I haven't done too badly. Look, the white areas are low resistance. So, here we have the metal drum here and here. And the dark areas are high resistance, so we have the concrete here, here, and also the pipe coming in here. Excellent. So I got it right. Yeah. Now, Chris, I have a little challenge for you. The builder would like his metal, plastic, and concrete blocks back. I'm pretty sharpest. Go for it, my man. Flip the resistance out on that. Why do I get talked into these jobs? I'm going to have words with her. I found some wire at last to mend that gauge. Which one shall I use, thick or thin? Which has the greater resistance? What do you think? Mm, the thin wire. It must be harder for the current to flow through the thin wire so it'll have great resistance. No way. It's the thick wire. There's more wire, so it'll be harder for the current to flow through it because it has to go through more wire. Yeah, I think it's the thick wire too because it's got more strength. No, it's the thin wire. 